Next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. His name is Dr. Nick Wadi. He teaches at Alfred State College. He's a European history professor and uh, always glad to have him on. Thank you for calling in, Dr. Wadi. I'm always glad to be here, Ryan. Thanks for having me. This day in history, always an interesting topic. You have two presidents. Uh, who were uh, inaugurated on this day in history, Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Let's start out with Lincoln's inauguration, Dr. Well, of course, Lincoln's inauguration occurred at a time when the country was was splintering. It was his election which triggered the secession of uh, many of the states in the South. And um, the only question that remained was, uh, would war break out? And, of course, eventually it did. And, uh, you know... um, both Lincoln and FDR have one thing in common. They're, they're U.S. presidents who are very widely admired, but, but who I have my reservations about because I think both of them were involved in a, in a very long-term process of the expansion of federal power. And, and both in their own way uh, were virtual dictators in, in times of war, and I think people forget about that. They overrode and trampled on uh, hallowed aspects of the Constitution. If I could stop you right there, Dr. Wadi, um, um, Kevin Dorn, the late Kevin Dorn, used to talk a lot about uh, his dislike, Kevin's dislike, of uh, President Lincoln's uh, expansion of uh, presidential powers during wartime. Um, what did Lincoln do, and also what did FDR do uh, in relation to uh, expanding uh, presidential powers in wartime? Mm-hmm. Well, I only know, I mean, these are my areas of expertise, but I, I think um, the federal government took over aspects of the economy, sort of federalized the uh, the railways. Uh, President Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. He unilaterally freed the slaves in the, in the states that had not seceded. Uh, he, he did a lot of things that were um, pretty presumptuous for a president. And, you know, at that time, the U.S. Constitution, uh, in, in in word and in deed, reserved powers to the states that were not specifically granted to the federal government. So he he uh, can be, I think, justly criticized for exceeding his power as president. And it was the fear that he would exceed his power as president that that helped to produce the Civil War, the the greatest uh, crisis in in American history and in American identity we've ever had. So. Um, President Lincoln helped us to overcome the Civil War, but he also helped to create it, and I think we need to understand that in its proper context. Talking to uh, Alfred State History Professor Dr. Nick Wadi. Yeah, uh, that's interesting that you bring that up. Like I said, uh, the late Kevin Doran used to criticize Lincoln all the time on that, and he always had to be careful uh, in his criticisms of Lincoln so as not to confuse the audience as to why he disliked Lincoln, but he said there was an incredible uh, expansion of uh, presidential powers not intended in the Constitution. Uh, Before we move on to other this day in history topics, was there anything, Dr. Waddy, you wanted to say about uh, Roosevelt or Lincoln? Yeah, well, uh, Roosevelt also, uh, I think the, the best example of his expansion of federal powers is the uh, the New Deal programs that he sort of pushed through in the 1930s initially against the uh, inclinations of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was sort of bullied into accepting those those expansions of federal authority. Uh, and in World War II, he uh, he acquired pretty sweeping semi-dictatorial powers as well. And uh, dissent against the war and against the policies of the federal government was. Uh, essentially disallowed. So uh, this is another case in which federal power was uh, lastingly expanded in this case. We often find federal power expanding in in wartime. It happened in the Civil War. It happened in the First World War. But oftentimes after the war is over, the federal government uh, doesn't entirely return to normal, but, but it relinquishes some of those powers and some of that revenue and and, and goes back to mining its own business to some degree. But after World War II, that, that really never happened. Um, the expansion of, of, of federal powers after World War II was uh, more or less permanent, and we're still living with it. Reading from an article here from uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, it says, uh, 
During the Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt ordered banks to confiscate gold from Americans who had purchased it and possessed it lawfully. And Judge Napolitano says, was that not theft? It also says, during World War I, Woodrow Wilson ordered federal agents to arrest people who sang German beer hall songs or read aloud from the Declaration of Independence in public. Was not that infringing on free speech? Uh, Dr. Watt, are your thoughts on what uh, Judge Napolitano says there? Well, those are reasonable questions, and of course it was also FDR who uh, initiated the policy to intern Japanese Americans. Uh, uh, however, um, I suppose you could say in his defense that, that all these policies were ultimately upheld by the courts. Now, because the courts say something is right doesn't make it right, but... Um, you know, as, as far as the gold goes, uh, you could, and <laughs> some people do, criticize any uh, form of taxation or confiscation by the federal government as, as theft. There's an interesting comparison to be made between uh, government and a protection racket. They're, <laughs> they're, they're not that different, except that, that government is legitimate and a protection racket isn't. So uh, those, those are some interesting distinctions. As long as I'm talking, uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, I have an article here from uh, an opinion piece that Napolitano wrote for the Washington Times. It says, FISA uh, contradicts the Constitution. And the article goes on to say, Congress enacted the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978 in response to the unlawful surveillance of Americans by the FBI and CIA during the Watergate era. President Richard Nixon, who famously quipped when leaving office that when the president done it, does it, that does not mean it's illegal. And Nixon used the FBI and CIA to spy on political opponents. And the article goes on to say that... Uh, FISA's stated purpose was to limit, not expand, the government's surveillance powers by requiring the intervention and permission of a judge. And it says, uh, a challenge has never reached, uh, reached a non-FISA court uh, because the government has never used evidence it admitted was obtained from a FISA warrant in a criminal case for fear that a federal court will invalidate the FISA standard. Your thoughts on what the Napolitano says there, uh, Dr. Nick Waddy? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, basically, uh, the issue is can the federal government use its legitimate interest in surveilling the foreigners and in foreign agents who might be engaged in spying on the United States? Can it there? use that, that legitimate power to indirectly spy on Americans? And if so, um, to what degree does it, need, uh, does it need to be supervised by the judiciary? Um, these are difficult questions, and of course, this is a very interconnected world, so foreign agents might have communications with people in the United States, and to some degree, you can understand why the federal government would need to access those communications. And it makes sense on the, on the face of it that there might be uh, a special brand of, of uh, federal judges who would oversee this process. On paper, it, it all seems fairly reasonable, but where it breaks down is, is implementation. Um, I think it's pretty clear that in the case of Carter Page and George Papadopoulos and, and the Trump campaign, that some very... Um, some very weak evidence was used to justify that uh, that surveillance, and we still don't know to what degree the Trump campaign as a whole or Donald Trump himself was surveilled by the United States government. And those are kind of interesting questions. So I can understand those who think that the FISA um, system should be abolished and the government should simply stop uh, surveilling American citizens in this way at all, but. I can also understand those who think that, that we need to, to keep an eye on, on uh, foreign spies and that this some type of system to, to supervise that is necessary. So I, my hope would be that they can find a way of, of reforming this system that will put some teeth in it and, and protect the civil liberties of the American people. 
Dr. Nick Wadi on this day in history, back in 2005, Martha Stewart released from prison. What do you remember about that and your thoughts on Martha Stewart? Well, of course, Martha Stewart is, a, is, a, is an icon. Um, and I remember that a lot of people were pretty gleeful, especially the sort of anti-corporate types that, you know, she engaged in some, some white-collar shenanigans and uh, some possible securities fraud, and she was ultimately convicted of obstruction of justice and lying. So here we get into some interesting terrain, because, uh, as we know, some people lie to federal agents and uh, in, in, it actually in a court of law or under deposition, and nothing ever happens to them. They certainly don't go to jail. Well, did she lie, or was it just an accidental contradiction? Well, that, that's that's another great question. Um, uh, if a person uh, misremembers something or gets something wrong under oath or talking to a federal agent, is that lying? Is that perjury? Is that should that be uh, prosecuted and punished? And clearly, what we're what we see is that these are crimes, especially lying and perjury. These are crimes that are. Um, subject to a great deal of prosecutorial discretion. And when uh, the prosecutor wants to nail someone, they go after this crime. And when they don't, they simply overlook it and brush it aside. And that's inherently problematic, but uh, it's also true of a lot of crimes. So um, I think, you know, with respect to Martha Stewart, I think you could certainly make the case that sending her to jail served no legitimate purpose and, and probably was excessive. Uh, and they were, they were probably making an example of her. Uh, and unfortunately, that's, that's the weakness of our justice system. Anytime you give leeway to the judges, uh, you can get sentences that are unreasonable at times. Talking now for State History Professor Dr. Nick Wadi, uh, we'll skip over the uh, Lucy and Desi divorce from 1960. But <laughs> no, no insult intended to uh, Lucy and Desi fans. Uh, in 1789, the government under the U.S. Constitution begins. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, where, where to begin? Because this is the beginning of our constitutional system. And, uh, you know, one thing we notice, I think, in American politics today is that everybody loves the U.S. Constitution. Um, they have nothing but, but good things to say about it. Uh, Democrats and Republicans think that they are being faithful to the U.S. Constitution and their vision of America's future is uh, exactly what the Founding Fathers intended. And so basically what people are doing is they're reading their own prejudices into the U.S. Constitution and interpreting it willy-nilly as they please. And um, I don't think there's any question that the way that the federal government behaves and the powers that it has arrogated to itself today are not what the Founding Fathers intended. And... Um, in some very important ways, we have remolded and reinterpreted the U.S. Constitution. We basically made it unrecognizable. Um, so, and that is, unfortunately, uh, it, go, it goes against the, the very nature of a constitution. The whole point of having a constitution was that there would be a foundational document that would uh, lay down some some un, uh, unchanging principles and and basic political realities that. The only way we'd be able to alter them is, is through the very difficult process of amendment. And we've found a way around that, and I'm afraid it's mostly liberals who have found a way around that. They have uh, created doctrines of, of judicial interpretation that, that basically say that the meaning of the Constitution is what you need it to mean at any particular time, and that's very dangerous. Going to take a quick break. When we come back with Dr. Uh, Nick Wadi, the Alfred State History Professor. Uh, what, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something I missed. Uh, today, this day in history, uh, Ronald and Nancy Reagan got married. Uh, did you want to comment quickly on that before we go to the break, Dr. Wadi? Oh, yes. Ronald and Nancy uh, got together. Lucy and Desi split up. And there's always drama in history, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was one of the great political marriages of, of the 20th century. And uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, uh, people, most people look back on the Reagan presidency 
positively now, and he's seen as one of the, the better presidents of the second half of the 20th century. But the truth is that Ronald Reagan was reviled by many Americans in, in the 1980s, and even more so his wife. You know, there's there one of the things that feminists say is that that women in positions of power uh, attract a special level of, of venomous uh, abuse and and derision, and uh, I think they might have a point about that because uh, some of the things that were said about Nancy Reagan were uh, really beneath contempt, um, and that that continues today uh, with with other women in other circumstances. So, um, you know, my my view is that uh, they were married for many decades. They're married with their marriage was very strong. She was an excellent first lady, very very dutiful with respect to. Uh, President Reagan and the country. Her her great cause was uh, uh, combating drug addiction and combating drug crime. Um, and uh, you know, you certainly have to respect the fact that she she stood by President Reagan uh, in the last years of his life when he had Alzheimer's, and uh, she was a great first lady. All right, now let's take the break. We'll be back in just a moment with Alfred State History Professor, Dr. Nick Waddy. Selecting a nursing home for a loved one isn't easy until you've discovered Hornell Gardens Nursing and Rehabilitation. Hornell Gardens delivers the highest level of care, compassion, and commitment with amenities and activities that will enrich body, mind, and spirit. It's a place that's close to home. Stop in for a tour of Hornell Gardens, located at 434 Monroe Avenue in Hornell, or to learn more, call 585-222-CARE or visit hurlbuttcare.com. Checking in now with meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Uh, Rob says it's a mix of clouds and sun. That's right. If you look out the window, Brian, right now, that's what you'd see here in Hornell, a mixture of clouds and sunshine. But it's a little bit more on the way. Cloudiness down over Ohio this morning, and some of that's headed our way. Uh, the day will average out partly to mostly cloudy. I think the sunniest part is this morning. Later today, you got to watch out for a stray shower. It should be breezy. Temperature's not faring too badly today, 40 to 45, so we continue to run uh, around normal today. Sunrise this morning was at 638. The sun sets tonight at 605. Tonight, we remain partly to mostly cloudy. I think the showers are out of here. Lows tonight between 25 and 30. Tomorrow looks like another nice day. Should be partly sunny throughout the entire day. Highs up around 45. Then we've got a weak disturbance heading through the Great Lakes tomorrow night. Some light snow develops late. Lows 30 to 35. Occasional light snow. Windy on Friday. We may see up to an inch. Temperatures on Friday, 35 to 40. Brian, it turns partly sunny, breezy with a high of 35 for Saturday. Then sunny and close to 50 on Sunday. And we're back with Alfred State History Professor Dr. Nick Wadi. Uh, it's the Democrats uh, at this point, uh, and I'm talking about the candidates running for president at this point in the race. So much has changed in a week. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that Joe Biden had been left for dead. He's finishing fourth and fifth and making, uh, uh, you know, just uh, people were making a mockery of him. And uh, now he's been brought back to life. Um, and he has been embraced by the establishment. He's been endorsed by Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, who all of a sudden left the race, and the wagons are really circling among establishment uh, slash moderate Democrats. And however, I think we need to step back and, and remember that this big momentum change happened very quickly. The betting markets now favor Biden to become the nominee, and not so long ago, people were. Dismissing him, you know, in the last debate, nobody bothered to attack Biden. I, I think because people were looking past Biden, they thought that Bernie Sanders was was the odds-on favorite to get the nomination, and he still could. Um, I think much will depend on whether uh, Bloomberg and Warren stay in this race for the long haul. If it's a four-way race, there's a very good chance of a brokered convention. And all bets are off at a broker convention. Anything could happen. But if it's a two-person race, I think you have to like Joe Biden's chances because, you know, as, as much as the Democratic Party has gone hard left and, and as angry and as extreme as many of the activists have become, I'm just not sure there's a majority in the Democratic Party's uh, primary electorate to support Bernie Sanders. So I think... Uh, you know, his, his only path to the nomination 
in all likelihood, is getting a majority of the pledge delegates, and that's going to be tough. So, um, you know, this has been a fascinating race, and it's only getting more interesting. Pat Buchanan says on his recent article, what is the establishment terrified of? He answers his own question. If Sanders is nominated, that Trump will crush Bernie Sanders in November. Not only then would the White House be lost, but all hopes of winning the Senate and blocking Trump's second-term Supreme Court nominees would be lost, too. And not only the Senate, but Nancy Pelosi's House could be lost. Dr. Waddy, what do you say to what Pat Buchanan says there? Well, he's, he's clearly right. Uh, a lot of Democrats are worried about they do about that. They they do believe that Bernie Sanders would be a a weak general election candidate you know, could be George McGovern all over again and, and lead his party to electoral disaster. Now, what his coattails would be, who knows? And you know, frankly, the national polls at this point say uh, that either Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden could could beat Donald Trump. And, we can't discount the possibility of either of those things happening. However, the Democrats also have to weigh the risks of denying the nomination to Bernie Sanders. What are the chances that Bernie Sanders runs as an independent? What are the chances that his supporters stay home or vote green in 2020? Um, uh, Sanders has to be handled with kid gloves, and still very possible that he could be the one who arrives at the convention with the most popular votes and the most delegates. And if so, can you really say, sorry, uh, you tried in 2016, you tried in 2020, but this party just will not have you as its nominee. And how does he react? How do his supporters react? So Democrats really are in a sort of no-win situation here, which, of course, is what Republicans love to see. Well, we've talked about Lucy and Desi, President Roosevelt, President Lincoln, the Reagans, and Martha Stewart today. Dr. Nick Waddy, before we go, is there anything else you wanted to bring up? Oh, I mean, are there any topics left? <laughs> I think we've covered everything. Scott and Lacey Peterson, I think they were big back in 2005. No comment, Brian. Thanks so much, Dr. Nick Waddy. Yeah, have a great week.